Hello and good day to you. This is Tracy Harrison from the School of Applied Functional Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about lab work. This is a topic that I very much enjoy chatting about because it's a fascinating duality today where uh, even through the functional medicine uh, lens, right? Even people who are practicing functional medicine, we tend to crave more data, more labs, uh, more information in hopes that it might be quite deterministic and tell us exactly what's going on. And believe me, the geek in me sees the geek in you, and I love data. I honor greatly that more data can give us practical guidance on where to focus in helping a unique individual. But yet at the same time that we tend to seek more data, Data. And, and as we've discussed before, functional medicine in, in many ways has a branding problem where we spend so much money on advanced testing, esoteric testing, deep diving testing, uh, in order to explore new avenues of biochemistry and physiology. Yet, we're not making optimal use of the ready, available, boring, everyday annual physical lab work that is so often uh, readily at hand. Uh, we so often are not maximally gleaning value and insight from from the information that we already have and we're turning to more esoteric or functional labs and something that we teach uh, through uh, at SAFM is that we should never seek more advanced especially expensive where uh, a patient has to pay for it out of pocket uh, testing when we're not actually uh, reaping first the full value of what we can get from the lab data they already have, especially easily accessible, uh, what we call everyday annual physical labs, but readily accessible blood markers that most people can get from their general practitioner, from their primary care physician. And in most cases, it's covered by insurance or is offered readily as part of national health services. Uh, and so today, while I could certainly talk about all of the marvels and value and esoteric interpretive uh, pearls that I want you to know from things like organic acids testing and urinary hormone testing and food sensitivity and intolerance testing and comprehensive stool testing. Yes, yes, yes. Those are all potentially of great value. But today I want to take a step back and talk about all of the things that we tend to be missing in the basic boring uh, everyday markers. Let's get started because I want to do some, some straight talk here, some truth telling right from the beginning. One of the biggest travesties in organized conventional medicine today is that we are not using the lab data that we have. Generally speaking, somehow the concept of a statistical normal range, which yes, is a statistical term. Uh, some of you may know that. You may remember that from your initial training, but somehow we've moved from norm to mean average, to mean okay, to mean acceptable, to mean healthy, to mean good, to mean fine, to mean everything's great. And, and that is not true. None of that is true. A statistical normal range, the reference range we think of in labs, my friends, we need to remember every day we're doing this work is, is not a target zone. It's certainly not a healthy zone. It's just the statistical norm. It's two standard deviations around the average or the norm. It's what 95% of the population actually has. So you can't be outside of the range unless you're in the extreme 2.5% on the upper end or the extreme 2.5% on the lower end. And yeah, there's a lot of disease and dysfunction in being clinically high or low, meaning outside the range. But when we have a whole litany of modern epidemic dis-ease dynamics in the people that we're serving in our practices, there is a massive amount of dis-ease inside reference ranges. And we've got to get trained and astute and savvy and disciplined about looking for it and calling it. Because otherwise what we're doing is truly irresponsible healthcare. We're waiting for an imbalance to become so bad that it trends outside of the reference ranges and becomes severe enough to be diagnosable. And 
then sometimes the disease dynamic is so entrenched at that point that there's quite a bit of suffering that has taken place. There's quite a bit of entrenched inflammation or imbalance or blockage or impairment in the body that it can still be unwound, but it's harder. We are not doing our best service for the patients and clients that we're serving by waiting waiting. We need to become astute and careful investigators looking for imbalance and blockage inside reference ranges and letting people know when there are opportunities to make lifestyle change, to address nutrient gaps, uh, to make different uh, dietary choices, different lifestyle choices, uh, in order to get in front of these uh, imbalances before they become severe enough to be diagnosable. That's what effective, good, comprehensive medicine will do. And so, yes, we need to remember that the normal ranges are not healthy ranges. They're not target zones. They're not. It's just what everybody has. But if everyone has a uh, 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 hyper adrenal function or insulin resistance or estrogen dominance or chronic inflammation, the last thing in the world you want to be is statistically normal, right? We want to help people to see in advance where things are uh, imbalanced. Because make no mistake, when we write on a piece of paper, all labs are fine. What people walk away thinking is, oh my gosh, I'm doing great. I'm just going to keep doing exactly what I was doing before. And that is a false assumption. Uh, in many cases, you can literally go back and look at your clients or patients lab work historically. I've done this dozens of times and you can see the past three, four, five annual physicals in a row. And you can watch, for example, their fasting glucose be 92. 95, 97, 99, 105, and then suddenly, oh my gosh, 105. Maybe I should now check hemoglobin A1C. Holy crap, it's 6%. Of course it is. We've watched it on our watch. We have done nothing while insulin resistance has progressed to the point of being severe enough to call it something. Now we can officially call it prediabetes. Uh, we are better than this. I believe we have the obligation to respond earlier. And this is why looking at trends is so important. If you're watching a person's fasting glucose and it's sitting at... Uh, 97 and you can go back and you can see how it's trended up, then that is an opportunity to act, to explain to people that fasting glucose is a per, uh, excuse me, insulin resistance is a progression. It doesn't appear overnight out of the blue, right? It's something that progresses and evolves. So many of the people in our practices have the false belief that uh, a diagnosis appears out of the middle of nowhere. For years and years, they were fine. For years and years, everything was going great. And then suddenly, out of the blue, I got hypertension. Or out of the blue, I got prediabetes. That never happens. It just doesn't. Minus some uh, acute uh, infection or uh, minus some actual injury or accident, these are chronic progressive functional imbalances that are brewing over time. And so, for example, if you take a look at someone's lab work, let's talk about trends for a minute. And we're looking at the, uh, a fasting glucose of uh, 92 then we can go and, and we can see, has that been their normal for the past several years? And so it's a stable dynamic in their body and it's simply part of who they are? Or was it last year 90 and the year before that it was 88 and the year before that it was 86? Uh, in which case we can see uh, a negative progressive trend toward this hyperglycemia type of dynamic. Just because it doesn't meet a diagnostic threshold does not mean that it isn't wreaking serious oxidative damage damage in their unique body, especially if their innate antioxidant function is not optimal, right? A, a fasting glucose, let's talk about hemoglobin A1C because that's more representative of an around-the-clock glucose status, but a hemoglobin A1C of 
5.5%. If someone has really strong antioxidant function, they may be handling it at in the lining of their arteries really quite well. But in other cases, maybe they have suboptimal glutathione function or they have suboptimal nitric oxide function. Then that subclinical elevation in hemoglobin A1C is likely wreaking some serious havoc on the endothelial lining of their arteries and contributing to uh, the buildup of atherosclerosis atherosclerotic plaque, contributing to the development of hypertension. And so we need to be looking for whether or not people's markers are optimal, right? Are they optimal? And in order to do that, we need to look at trends. We also need to look at their unique lifestyle choices. So let's say someone has a, a fasting glucose of 80, fasting glucose of 80 or 82. Well, we want to think about who is this person, not so much just what is the marker result, but uh, that marker may be a well representative of someone eating, for example, a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, because they thrive in that way. And it's perfectly natural and normal for them to have a lower fasting glucose because they do well using pr um, more fatty acid oxidation for fueling their body. And they function generally at an aggregate average lower glucose uh, load. So this means that the pancreas is going to have adapted to a lower glucose load and the fasting insulin levels are generally gonna, going to be lower. And it's quite normal for them to have a lower fasting glucose. But what if on the other hand, someone's eating a standard American diet that's really loaded with um, an, maybe an excessive level of carbohydrates, especially relative to their uh, relative physical activity, uh, and uh, a lot of refined carbohydrates and sweeteners and sugars? What about if their fasting glucose is 80 or 82? That's a completely different scenario. Even though the numbers are the same, it's a completely different scenario uh, where in that uh, situation, we would expect their fasting glucose to be quite a bit higher in terms of navigating that magnitude of glucose load in the diet. And so we would want to check something like a fasting C-peptide or a fasting insulin, which you probably in that scenario would find is elevated right? Subclinically elevated as evidence of the pancreas beginning to adapt to an excessive glucose load in their life. And again, this is where we can help them to, to see this. We can get the data to characterize this, help a unique patient to understand it so that they can begin to make lifestyle choices. But two people can have the same lab marker result for very different reasons. And the subclinical shifts in a downward trend or in an upward trend can give us key information for helping people to proactively make change and actually avoid a diagnosis entirely, which ultimately I believe should be the very first goal of comprehensive health care, of good medicine. Uh, so another thing I want to talk about with regard to fasting glucose, right? Uh, I mentioned hemoglobin A1C, which may surprise some of you. I believe hemoglobin A1C should be a part of every annual physical because fasting glucose uh, is a reflection of, yes, the adaptive level of insulin that the pancreas is putting out in anticipation of our, the typical glycemic load of our life. That's very true. And we need to remember that the glycemic load of our life is not just about diet. It's also about stress uh, because our cortisol awakening response, the classic diurnal curve of cortisol that peaks within an hour after awakening is also an adaptive response from the adrenal gland in anticipation of our typical stress load. The pancreas and the adrenals are doing the same thing. They are trying to adapt to accommodate the life that we are asking them to live in. And they can do that for quite some time and they can handle it episodically quite resiliently. But when it becomes our standard everyday uh, ongoing chronic lifestyle choice, we of course, as we know, can run into some significant dis-ease because of the progressive effects of hyperinsulinemia where the glycemic load of our life keeps growing higher and higher. So the pancreas says, no worries, I gotcha. And it keeps putting out higher and higher and higher 
levels of insulin. Uh, and, and this has uh, negative metabolic effects, negative pro-inflammatory uh, effects in the body. Uh, but the same thing with the adrenal glands. It looks at our stress uh, and says, no worries, I gotcha. And it keeps pumping out more cortisol first thing in the morning to protect our bodies from the effects of that stress. And again, episodically, that's great. But when that becomes our chronic dynamic, then those elevated levels of stress hormones have a price. Uh, and just like Higher glucose, higher stress hormones can wreak a serious, uh, not only oxidative effect, um, but in the case of stress hormones, a pretty dramatic catabolic effect that promotes breakdown uh, and damage in the body in the name of survival, but as a long-term mode uh, is very much disease promoting. And so we need to remember that fasting glucose isn't just about diet. It's highly influenced by the cortisol awakening response, which is why we, we see this increase, this boost uh, in glucose in the morning. It's normal and natural as a response to the body orchestrated by cortisol. Uh, but a person can have an aggressive cortisol awakening response because of stress because of stress. But then if you compare their fasting glucose to their hemoglobin A1C, the gaps could go in all different ways. You could see a fasting glucose that's really quite commensurate with the hemoglobin A1C, telling you that the fasting glucose, maybe if it's elevated, is representative of a around the clock hyperglycemic dynamic. Or you can see a strong high fasting glucose paired with a notably lower hemoglobin A1C, uh, perhaps indicating that a person has a strong primed first morning stress response. But otherwise, around the rest of the clock, their diet and their lifestyle are, are keeping glucose at a much more optimal place. Right? We have to think about these distinctions. On the other hand, in some cases, you may see a fasting glucose that's really quite optimal, right? Maybe it's 84 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, but then you measure hemoglobin A1C, and this person is diabetic. And that's because they're in a hypoadrenal state, maybe a more uh, extended suppressive state, a stress state where the HPATG coordinated hormonal axis uh, is more of, in more of a hypoadrenal state and our cortisol levels are quite lower. They're suppressed and, and people can actually start to lose the characteristic diurnal curve of cortisol and get more of just a small bump in the morning or even worse, more of a flatline type of dynamic where the circadian rhythm has really become dysregulated uh, in uh, regard to adrenal hormones. Uh, and in this case, you can actually see fasting glucose notably low, and we can make the mistake of calling it optimal and calling it healthy. Because, but then if we look at hemoglobin A1C, it may really be quite high, and we're missing the opportunity to understand that fasting glucose is artificially low because of cortisol, because of adrenal function. This is some of the devil in the detail that I believe strongly that all healthcare practitioners need to understand. Because otherwise, we're just giving fasting glucose a quick eyeball. And many of us know we're smart, we're savvy, we know, okay, it's not just a matter of it being clinically high or low, but I'm going to glance at it, I'm going to say, ah, it's 88, it's fine, it's 92, it's fine, or even, oh my gosh, it's 81, it's perfect. Maybe, maybe not. Well, we teach it's very important to never evaluate any one single lab marker on its own independently because it can be misleading. We need to look at each individual lab marker as a puzzle piece uh, on its own. And just like a jigsaw puzzle that you would put together, you never learn everything you need to know just from one puzzle piece. We have to put them together into patterns in order to see the unique picture of this per unique person's uh, uh, life system come into a more homely focused view. And so we need to be looking at common collections of puzzle pieces and put them together and see what it tells us about a unique individual's dis-ease or wellness and respond proactively. Uh, some other um, things I want to share with you in terms of common gotchas. One of them is the misstep of assuming that 
higher and higher levels of good stuff is always better. And lower and lower levels of bad stuff is, is always better, right? Well, not necessarily. We know that uh, certain substances in the body can become notably, notably dysfunctional at higher or lower levels. And again, even though we may think about a normal range, when we're thinking about optimal levels, we have to consider the dysfunction of subclinically high as well as subclinically lower levels. One of the best examples of that is HDL, right? High density lipoprotein. Unfortunately, too many of us are still calling this the good cholesterol, which is a serious misnomer because if HDL is good, then that means LDL is bad, which is a completely false. LDL, LDL is a lipoprotein. It's the only carrier of LDL out from the liver that goes to uh, do all sorts of tissue repair, new cell generation, fortification of um, cell membranes, the synthesis of steroid hormones. Uh, LDL is not bad. Uh, it can become dysfunctional, but as many of you may be aware, HDL can also become dysfunctional. It is not true that just higher and higher and higher levels of HDL is better. We're actually understanding more and more that HDL right in the, the upper uh, 10 to 15 percent of the normal range, as well as clinically high HDL, is very likely to have become dysfunctional. Uh, it loses its reverse cholesterol transport functions, and so it stops being good. It actually can become pro-atherogenic and start to contribute to uh, the uh, cardiovascular metabolic dysfunction that we see uh, courtesy of uh, lipid-mediated uh, oxidative damage and plaque buildup on the lining of our arteries. And so more and more HDL is not good. In fact, notably elevated HDL should be a first indicator for you of looking for markers of oxidative stress. Now, you can combine that with looking at things like uric acid and bilirubin. These are things that we think about as long as they're somewhere down in the normal range, they're fine. And when they're elevated, there's a serious problem, right? When bilirubin is notably elevated, we think, oh, there's a hemolytic uh, dynamic going on, right? Maybe an autoimmune kind of, of issue uh, or a, a bleeding uh, dynamic. Or uh, if uric acid is elevated, we think, oh, gout, right? The urate crystal mediated arthritis that we often see, for example, in type 2 diabetes, which is uh, when it's elevated is definitely a marker of uh, oxidative stress. But what about when things like uric acid and uh, bilirubin are really low? What about when those levels are really low? Do you think about what those could be an indication of? Well, uh, contrary to common understanding, both bilirubin and uric acid, they're not, obviously not evil substances, but they both serve strong, normal antioxidant function in the body. And you can see either of these fairly everyday markers being notably low for a couple of common reasons. One of them is because of oxidative overload, excessive oxidative stress that the body is not well handling because our supply of bilirubin and of uric acid can be depleted because we have high oxidative stress. So when you're looking at uric acid being way down in the bottom uh, 15 uh, percent or so, 15 to 20 percent of the reference range, think about again what other markers could be indicating that there are problems here with oxidative overload that again I want to get in front of. We want to respond to that proactively. But also on the other side, Oh, a key misstep in lab work interpretation is that the body has to have sufficient levels of nutrients in order to make the substances that we want to be able to objectively measure in labs to give us key insight. And so, as we like to say at SAFM, no lettuce, no salad, right? Uh, we can talk about salad, but if we don't have lettuce, we can't make it. Well, we can talk about things like bilirubin, but uh, the enzyme that changes biliverdin to bilirubin requires zinc. If someone is deficient in zinc, they're going to struggle to make optimal levels of the enzyme that's needed to make that conversion. 
the, the enzyme that makes uric acid, right? Uh, xanthine oxidase requires molybdenum, right? A huge number of enzymes in the body requires minerals. Uh, we talk often about because of topsoil erosion uh, and mo uh, modern factory scale farming, which by the way happens in both the conventional and the organic farming communities, we tend to have um, insufficiency of minerals in our diet because minerals come from the soil. And when you keep just over planting and harvesting the same square mile of land over and over and over and over again without replenishing it with minerals, it runs out. Of course it does right and so we end up with way less mineral density in our foods and things like zinc and copper and iron and manganese and molybdenum uh, and magnesium are critical for ensuring that we have the enzymes for catalyzing these critical reactions in the body uh, so yes we may lack enough zinc or enough molybdenum in order to make some of these conversions and so the levels of these markers could be lower not because of a systemic dynamic in the body, but simply because there, are, there isn't optimal sufficiency of those nutrients to make that substance. Another great example of that is what we often think of as liver enzymes or liver function tests. Um, ALT, AST, um, ALP, alkaline phosphatase, GGT, right? Glamo gamma glutamyl transferase. Again, these are enzymes. They require nutrients. And in particular, the liver enzymes require vitamin B6. And when you look to see a pattern of these enzymes that are really quite low, uh, especially down in the bottom 20% of the normal range, uh, especially single digits uh, or even clinically low, you want to think about what the circumstances might be with regard to insufficiency of vitamin B6. Oh, we know, for example, that that is one of the nutrients that's most likely to be driven low through uh, consistent use of uh, estrogen containing uh, medications, oral contraceptives, for example. Uh, and that that over time, even within the space of a few months, especially if someone was starting out with suboptimal B6 status, that this can render an insufficiency that starts to impair their ability to produce these enzymes. And you can't use a marker as an objective assessment of anything if the body doesn't have enough raw ingredients to make the recipe to show you what's going on. Right? No lettuce, no salad. We know that alkaline phosphatase, if it's low in a pattern with the other liver enzymes, you want to think about sufficiency of B6. But maybe the other enzymes are, are optimal, uh, mid-range, for example. But maybe alkaline phosphatase on its own is suppressed and down in the bottom of uh, 10 to 15 percent of the reference range or maybe clinically low. We know through research that this is highly associated with insufficiency of magnesium, zinc, or vitamin B12. So again, you can start to look for patterns in the other markers. And these are things that with plenty of case practice, like we do at SAFM, you can start to quickly pull these puzzle pieces together because you get a lot of real life complex case practice and you've done it dozens of times and you can quickly know what markers to put together uh, in terms of looking for common puzzle pieces that could point to specific needs and opportunities for this unique individual. Uh, so um, Alkaline phosphatase can be a, a really potent uh, indicator when it's elevated and spilling excessively into the blood of a, a blockage uh, in the tissues that make uh, significant amounts, or the, sorry, the tissues that house significant amounts of alkaline phosphatase, uh, especially the... Um, the liver, the hepatic biliary uh, junction, uh, in bones, in the intestines. And so an elevation in alkaline phosphatase can be a, a, a key indication of what's at play. But a person can have rock bottom alkaline phosphatase because of a nutrient deficiency and some overt hepatic biliary congestion. And that marker can't show you that dynamic because there's not enough lettuce to make that salad. 
so that you can actually see what is at play. This is a wonderful reminder, by the way, that nutrients, micronutrients are not optional. Uh, our, our entire biochemistry, myriad processes in the human body depends on micronutrient sufficiency. And our modern diet is unfortunately more and more um, hypercaloric and hyperchemical laden, but nutrient poor. And this is where we can help people to uh, see uh, where these imbalances are brewing, again, proactively before something becomes severe enough to be diagnosable. Uh, another um, marker that I want to talk about is homocysteine. This is a hot, hot topic in the functional medicine world. It has been for the past couple of years, and it's becoming even more so. Uh, but homocysteine is um, an amino acid that is produced uh, in the methylation cycle. Uh, it is normal, by the way, right? So we should have some homocysteine as evidence that we're fueling the methylation cycle. And we know that elevated homocysteine can be uh, an, an independent risk marker of cardiovascular disease. It can be evidence of uh, blockage uh, in the methylation cycle. That may be because of um, you know, genetic issues with regard to impairment in the various enzymes in the cycle. It can be because of a lack of the sufficient nutrients that are needed to drive it, especially B vitamins. It may be insufficient intake of methionine, which is an essential amino acid, in order to fuel uh, homocysteine, excuse me, fuel the methylation cycle. Uh, and we can do some deep diving to understand that. And But we understand that elevated homocysteine can be uh, a marker of um, excessive uh, inflammation, right? Uh, but what about low homocysteine? This is another marker like HDL, where so often practitioners will believe the higher the HDL, the better or the lower the homocysteine, the better. It's not true at all. In fact, we well understand that like so many markers, there is an optimal zone for the typical individual inside of that normal range. And we know that in a, a typical reference range, at least, for example, based on American uh, standards and, and metrics, uh, we would think about a homocysteine being less than 15 micromoles per liter as being um, normal. Well, we know through study that um, optimal levels of homocysteine are likely between about four and seven, right? Sort of the, uh, the second quartile or so of that range. Because what we're learning is that the lower homocysteine goes, people are much more likely to have impaired antioxidant function. It can be evidence that they are hypermethylators, and this can actually deplete their antioxidant status, um, in especially in terms of glutathione sufficiency. And so we want to be looking for these. A homocysteine of 1.2 uh, is likely a, an opportunity to look at what is their aggregate antioxidant function and how can I assess what is at play and help them to address key nutrient gaps or overall dietary changes, uh, whether it's, for example, boosting intake of cruciferous and allium family vegetables, which we know have phytonutrients in them that um, upregulate the activity of the NRF2 enzyme which catalyzes greater activity of a number of different critical antioxidant enzymes, including glutathione function. Uh, and so this is yet another example of lower and lower is likely not optimal of a negative thing and higher and higher of a good thing often becomes dysfunctional. And so we want to learn about optimal zones of markers and what the markers are actually measuring so that we can look beyond the reference ranges and gauge what is at play in a unique individual. Uh, I want to take a moment to talk about the fact that, of course, lab values, the utility of all lab data and information is purely based on the objective circumstances in which the blood draw was made. And uh, I am amazed at the number of practitioners who still don't give good, solid guidance to their patients about the circumstances in which they should have a blood draw. 
uh, we, we talk a lot about advising um, a, a patient on important lifestyle choices to promote health. Things like sleep hygiene, things like eating hygiene. Well, I'm going to pen the phrase lab hygiene, right? Not just in the sense of washing your hands so that you've got a good, clean uh, blood draw, but what are you going to do in advance of a blood draw to make sure that all of the data is optimally useful? Well, the first things we need to do is uh, encourage people to stop taking their supplements two or three days before the lab draw. So if they're going in to get a lab draw, say on a, a Thursday morning, then recommending that they not take their supplements. Now, obviously there may be critical medications. They should absolutely keep taking those. There may be really critical supplements, especially if someone is taking a probiotic or a digestive aid, right? That they simply may need to continue. But things that are related to nutrients and herbs, it really makes sense for them to stop taking them because in a number of cases, the supplement itself interferes with the accuracy of the lab assay. Not internal to the body, but interferes uh, with regard to putting substances in the blood that interferes with the objectivity of the actual lab assessment using the, the assay methodology and measurement tools that a given lab uh, is, is using as a normal process. One of the best examples of this is biotin, vitamin B7. Taking high dose biotin is super popular right now for people who want to support better hair growth or nail growth. And there's a lot of people taking excessive biotin, which has other issues by the way, um, but that's another topic for another day. But biotin interferes in the actual lab assessment after the blood draw with the accuracy of thyroid hormone uh, lab data. And so if a person was using a high dose biotin supplement right in the run up to the day before they got a blood draw, then you can just ignore their entire thyroid panel. Not useful. Uh, and so given what research is generally shown about retention of these excessive nutrient levels in the body, we recommend that people stop their supplements just for the three days in advance. We don't recommend that they stop them at some other random time, like two weeks before or two weeks before or a month before, because then their lab data is sorta kinda affected by what they were taking before and sorta kinda affected by the fact that they've stopped it. And again, we don't have an objective baseline against which to gauge the data. So if a, if a person has been taking a supplement, you want that supplement to reflect the underlying biochemistry that is at play. You just want them to stop at the three days beforehand so it doesn't muck with the accuracy of the actual lab assay. So we recommend continuing probiotics or digestive uh, supplements in particular so that people have a, a typical easeful type of experience, especially with regard to affecting GI function, uh, digestive function, and immune system regulation. But stepping away for all other supplements uh, for those three days so that the lab data is much more likely to be reliable. I hate to say it, the other piece that you must educate people about is what does first morning fasting state mean? Okay, my friends, <laughs> it's amazing the number of people who are telling people that, you know, fasting, fasting, it's okay if you have coffee. No, it's not. That is not fasting. People need to know that fasting means 10 to 12 hours having consumed nothing but water. 10 to 12 hours, nothing but water. But it is important that people drink water because sometimes when you give guidance on um, fasting, people are afraid to, um, do, to intake anything. And so they end up dehydrated and you can look for common patterns of lab markers that clearly indicate dehydration, which again is going to unfortunately skew the lab markers and make them less objectively reliable for showing the dynamics that you're gonna to want to gauge. So really telling people that you want them to be well hydrated, but you don't want them to consume anything but water for 10 to 12 hours before the labs, they should get up in the morning on a typical day, right? Uh, a, a, I'd like to say a typical a weekday, <clears throat> 
where you have a nice relaxed time to get to the lab where you go and do that first thing uh, in the morning, right, before you go and do other lab activities, where you haven't consumed any other uh, foods and where you didn't have crazy strange life circumstances happen just in the few days beforehand. So it's not it's not helpful to have people uh, go and get a lab draw the day after they had a terrifying car accident. It's also not helpful to have people go and get a lab draw the day they came back from 10 days of vacation at the beach. Uh, where they may have been super relaxed, but also been drinking a really uh, abnormal amount of margaritas and chewing on nachos when that's not their typical diet. We want the lab draw to be uh, at the end of a, a phase of normal life so that we're actually getting their normal baseline. Uh, and so absolutely, uh, they're still going to be vulnerable to a white coat type of dynamic, right? And we need to remember that people can have a stress-mediated skewing of all sorts of different uh, measurements, not just blood pressure. You can white coat to react to all sorts of things, including uh, fasting glucose, including LDL, uh, including things like fibrinogen, by the way, a number of things that are affected by stress. And, and so that's always going to be a, a part of having a blood draw, especially indeed if people are afraid of needles. But if we can teach them about this in advance, that we want them to get up restfully and mindfully. Go to bed early the night before. Uh, don't get up and rush around like a crazy person in order to dash off to the lab. Don't leave your home so that you have to speed like a crazy person to get to the lab and almost have an accident and you're stressed out when you get there, right? Plan to give your best normal showing at the labs uh, in order so that we know we get objectively useful data. Really key guidance because if you don't tell people they're going to Google it or they're going to assume, oh, I fasted. All I had was coffee and orange juice, right? Or they're not going to drink water and they're going to be super dehydrated. And you're going to see that pattern in the labs by a notable, notable elevation in multiple markers that are measured as concentrations in overall blood volume. And in particular, uh, really high subclinical or even clinically high levels of things that really are atypically elevated like that, such as hematocrit or albumin, right? You want to look for some of these patterns that may indicate that everything that's a concentration marker is skewed high because of dehydration. But again, we can get in front of these kinds of uh, dynamics. Uh, some other gotchas I want to talk about uh, very briefly. Some of them, uh, I imagine most of you are aware, but I just want to mention them for the sake of completeness. We need to be measuring full thyroid panels. We've got to collectively hold one another accountable. Teach your colleagues that relying on TSH to be an objective, accurate, single marker of intracellular thyroid hormone sufficiency throughout the body is woefully old school and inaccurate. Uh, <laughs> oh, there can be all sorts of different dynamics that create hypothyroid function in the body. And some of the most common ones don't even have to do overtly with the thyroid. Uh, but TSH is just a brain hormone that is responding to a biofeedback process. And other tissues in the body can be struggling with hypothyroid function even while the brain is, is satisfied. But even if T4 thyroid hormone is perfect. People can have poor conversion of T4 to T3 thyroid hormone. Um, they can have issues with regard to a uh, really high conversion of T4 to reverse T3, for example. There are a number of different imbalances and we definitely need to be looking at full thyroid panels. Dozens and dozens and dozens of times, even I personally, not to mention the thousands of practitioners at SAFM, People are shocked to find out what a th full thyroid panel actually shows, where TSH has been looking not only normal, but maybe optimal for years, year after year after year. But that person is still exhausted, still has constipation and dysmotility, right? Still has brain fog, still has thinning on the outer third of their eyebrow, still has dry skin and all of these classic symptoms of hypothyroid function. We need to be looking at full panels.
Another thing that I feel like is uh, maybe well understood within the functional community, but we've really got to stop start teaching all of our colleagues is stop diagnosing iron deficiency anemia without checking ferritin. I can't tell you how many people I even again, I personally have seen where people were recommended substantial dosage iron supplements simply because hemoglobin or serum iron were suboptimal or clinically low. But ferritin, our primary storage form of iron was never checked and turns out ferritin is high. The body doesn't need more iron. It is purposefully sequestering it uh, in as a, an inflammatory response. Uh, in order to protect the body from the oxidative effects of higher levels of iron uh, or to uh, uh, prevent iron from uh, exacerbating some type of infectious dynamic. Uh, and, and so it's irresponsible to recommend iron without checking ferritin because there can be challenges with regard to an inability uh, to actually make use of the iron in the body. People can have low hemoglobin and maybe have symptoms of iron deficiency anemia simply because they don't have enough vitamin B6 to make optimal levels of hemoglobin. They got plenty of iron. They just aren't able to synthesize enough hemoglobin. But because so many people in our practices who come to see us are struggling with a chronic inflammatory uh, dynamic, really often you may see uh, suboptimal levels of hemoglobin and or serum iron. They may even be clinically low, but you might be shocked to check ferritin and it may be optimal or even notably high. People don't need more iron in that scenario. In fact, iron supplementation can be dangerous in that scenario. What they need is help and investigation from you to get at the root cause of why the body is sequestering that. I actually think elevated ferritin is a much more reliable marker of chronic inflammation than something like CRP. C-reactive protein can be more of a labile, overly optimistic marker that responds quite quickly to improvements or reductions in inflammation. Um, but ferritin is more of a stodgy conservative marker and the body tends to only let go of sequestered iron after the immune system is quite sure that the threat has passed. And so this can be a good reliable marker that uh, an infectious or chronic inflammatory dynamic like an autoimmune disease is indeed progressively resolving good evidence that the body believes it. Uh, and so we need to be checking ferritin in that kind of scenario. Uh, another one is looking at electrolytes. Whew, still way too many practitioners looking at uh, sodium and potassium and assuming that those are just a direct reflection of the diet. And if sodium is high, then reducing sodium in the diet is all we need to do to bring that down. Or if uh, potassium is low or potassium is high, all we have to do is change it in the diet. And that's going to take care of the dysfunction. Sure, we get electrolytes from our food and, and intake is an important consideration. But much more importantly is the teamwork of our adrenal glands and our kidneys in modulating electrolyte retention and loss through the urine in order to help us to try to optimally function in the environment in which we're living. And we know that Part of why the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys is so that we can modulate electrolytes to help us to weather stress. And it's normal functioning in a sympathetic nervous system mode uh, and with higher levels of cortisol uh, for the body to prioritize retaining more sodium. You can see a natural skewing in the electrolytes where sodium tends to go up and potassium tends to go down. Depending on other things that are happening, other pH balances in the body, chloride may also go up. And you're seeing a skewing here, which if you think about it, with the higher uh, sodium, it makes it easier to have higher blood pressure, right? Uh, higher heart rate in order to uh, uh, accomplish amazing physical feats in the name of surviving so that you can fight and flight and hide and defend and lift, small, lift cars off of small children, right? Um, this is this is a positive thing. It promotes survival. And so we may look at it and think, oh, that promotes hypertension. Yeah, it does on purpose. Uh, and so helping people to get at the roots of why their body is in that, uh, that stress state 
and making lifestyle choices in order to bring it down so that their adrenal kidney function is not going to completely overload and overlord whatever dietary choices people are making. We need sodium and potassium in order to thrive, but the body is going to purposefully modulate those two electrolytes in response to our stress state. And stress in the body through the functional lens we know includes not only mental emotional dynamics, uh, but also uh, physiological and biochemical dynamics, especially things we tend to overlook like sleep apnea. My goodness, sleep apnea is so highly underassessed, underexplored, and certainly underdiagnosed. But perhaps no greater source of physiological stress for the body than feeling like you almost died overnight because of oxygen deprivation. Uh, we know that this type of disordered and dysfunctional breathing is a major source of daily chronic physiological stress on the body that can be a major contributor to progressive acceleration of stress dynamics in the body. Uh, definitely something you want to be thinking about. It's not just a matter of whether people are sleeping and how many hours they're sleeping. What's their quality of sleep? Are they sleeping at length and deeply and consistently? And do they have good, easy breathing through their nose throughout the night? That is restful restorative sleeping. A huge number of people are not sleeping well and are promoting disease dynamics in their bodies because of disordered overnight breathing. Uh, mouth breathing, my goodness, we should have a lab marker for mouth breathing because I think that is triggering all sorts of chronic diseases in the body. It is not okay. Oh, we are designed to breathe through our noses. Actually, our whole nasal sinus Laryngeal structure is supported by and honed and made fit through the constant action of breathing through our nose and the pressure of, of air. And we actually can end up with all sorts of dysfunction here. And the more we breathe through the mouth, the more we're likely to become, to have some shifts in the anatomy and the physiology of this uh, function. Uh, piece of the body and mouth breathing begets the need to, to breathe more through the mouth. Uh, it's very much a use it or lose it uh, type of dynamic in the body. And so uh, assessing, even though it's not an official lab marker, right? Assessing a breathing, especially assessing mouth breathing and teaching people that mouth breathing is not healthy. We need to get at the roots of why people are doing that and help to eradicate it because otherwise it's just a matter of time before something becomes severe enough to be diagnosable. I know we're going to run out of time here. I've got some other things I want to talk about, but I want to pull us to a close by suggesting uh, what we would recommend with regard to changes in what we look at on an annual basis in order to get in front of some of the most common uh, functional imbalances in the body proactively, ideally preventatively, again, within normal ranges so that we can respond. Certainly, you may have additions to this based on a unique individual's challenges or history or prior lab markers when you're looking at the, the history of lab values. But we believe that every annual physical lab panel for adults should not only include a complete blood count and a complete metabolic profile, but it should include hemoglobin A1C for sure. It should include fasting C peptide or fasting insulin. Ideally fasting C peptide because it is also a good marker of insulin release and it has a longer half-life. We should be, make sure that gamma glutamyl transferase, GGT, is included. Depending on where you are around the world, GGT is not included as part of a metabolic panel or a hepatic function uh, panel. Oh, it is well understood that uh, GGT optimally is in about the second quartile. The entire upper half of the reference range is a wake-up call for um, oxidative stress, for insufficiency of glutathione function in the liver. Talk about something we want to get in front of given the widespread incidence of metabolic disease in our patient communities. 
I believe all women should be getting a full thyroid panel uh, at least every other year and every year if they continue to wrestle with uh, clear symptoms of hypothyroid function and we got to get way beyond constipation and stubborn weight gain being the only classic symptoms of hypothyroid. Um, red blood cell magnesium, whew, definitely something we should be checking across the board. Sometimes insufficient levels of magnesium is the reason why people have suboptimal levels of vitamin D. Uh, red blood cell magnesium would be on our list. And then methylmalonic acid, in particular for anybody over the age of 60. Uh, because it is a, a functional intracellular, it's actually a mitochondrial marker of vitamin B12 insufficiency. And it is a common insufficiency with people as we age, as we go into the senior years, because of a natural progression of hypochlorhydria as we age. Uh, that can be because of a brewing hypothyroid or a stress-mediated dynamic. It can also be because of a, a simmering H. pylori overgrowth in the gut, in the gastric cavity that may not be severe enough to cause gastritis, much less an ulcer. Uh, but the natural reduction in immune function that happens as we age may be allowing this natural endemic member of our human microbiome to simply be opportunistic in overgrowing. And part of its natural th uh, thriving is to suppress the synthesis of stomach acid. Uh, and we have to have good, strong stomach acid in order to prepare vitamin B12 for absorption further down in the intestines. And we need to be looking for serum B12, uh, especially here in the, um, in the U.S., where the normal range can be something like 190 to 900, the entire lower two thirds of that is likely insufficient. And this is the difference between looking for the presence of a nutrient in the blood versus looking at a functional marker of its sufficiency in a unique individual. Because you and I could take the exact same amount of B12 in our food or in our supplement. And depending on our lifestyle, depending on our genetics, it's plenty for you. Your methylmalonic acid is rock bottom. You feel fantastic. And that exact same amount in my body is an acute deficiency. And I am suffering mightily. And my methylmalonic acid is clinically high. Uh, it's not about the uh, of a specific amount of the nutrient it's about functional sufficiency in each unique person's body and so cmp and cbc absolutely uh, but hemoglobin a1c and fasting c peptide or fasting insulin to check metabolic function gamma glutamyl transferase to get a good insight into antioxidant function especially something that tends to start to elevate subclinically in the early stages uh, of um, the liver struggling with oxidative overload. Full thyroid panel, I said a mostly for women because women many times over are the ones more likely to struggle with uh, thyroid dysfunction. And so certainly it could be checked for men as well, but uh, women, I think it's our four times more likely to uh, struggle with um, uh, uh, a hypothyroid function uh, in particular. Methylmalonic acid for everyone, uh, I would say over about the age of 60. Uh, and so these are some opportunities to, to get a keener look at some of the markers that could help to give us insight proactively, preventatively, functionally for a unique individual before things become severe enough to be diagnosable. While there's still evidence of functional imbalances and dis-ease, blockage, impairment in the body early enough when they're much more straightforward to correct and bring back into the optimal zone so that people don't suffer needlessly. I want to appreciate all of you for being out here on the progressive edge of the future of effective healthcare. Uh, labs uh, are valuable, critical pieces of information, but we've got to start gleaning maximum value from the labs that are readily available. And we've got to stop looking at singular markers and just treating a lab value, right? We've got to go upstream. We're, we're not just replacing drugs with supplements. We're not just recommending an herb or a nutrient for one lab marker. 
you're better than that. We collectively as a tribe are better than that. We can use collections of puzzle pieces and multi-marker uh, patterns in order to help actually see what is at play upstream in a unique individual so that we can better guide them to actually address it at the root so it goes away. No management required, no ongoing oversight required. It goes away because the body will naturally in its wisdom come back into its innate state of functional balance. Thank you so much for joining me and I wish you a lovely day. Take care.